Welcome uh, to the session, Envisioning Psychedelic Prescription Medicine in Europe, a Science Vision Quest. My name is Claudia Schwarz-Plaschk and I'm your moderator today. This year's motto for ESOF is freedom for science, science for freedom. Establishing and defending the freedom for science is a central concern for the field of research. This session is convened around psychedelic science. area of research both in Europe and the United States in the 1950s and 60s. But during the 1960s, the public perceptions uh, of psychedelic substances slowly began to change as molecules such as LSD and psilocybin escaped the laboratories and moved into the hippie counterculture. These at first promising substances for the treatment of various mental health conditions became increasingly demonized by those in power who considered their use as enemies to the existing status quo. In 1970, then US President Nixon banned psychedelics along other drugs, a po political move we now know that also contributed to the fading of psychedelic research during the next few years. Although there were a variety of factors responsible for the cessation of psychedelic science activities, US and also international drug laws that followed the US model played an important part in stifling the research. Psychedelic substances have been placed into the most restrictive drug category, which ascribes them a high potential for abuse and no currently accepted medical use. David Nutt, a renowned neuropsychopharmacologist from Imperial College London, declared that international drug laws impinge upon the freedom of psychedelic science in a way similar to when the Catholic Church banned the telescope. Attempts to reclaim the freedom for psychedelic science have been emerging since the mid-1980s which was when another psychedelic substance that showed huge promise for applications in psychotherapy was made illegal, MDMA. Again, similar to what happened in the 1960s, the widespread use of MDMA, this time in club culture as ecstasy, contributed to its vilification by conservative forces. One of our speakers who I hope will join us, uh, he hasn't uh, joined yet, I, I, get, I think, Rick Doblin, founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, Short Maps, has, be, has been one of the central driving forces in the movement to reestablish psychedelics as legitimate substances for research and therapeutic uses. In recent years, psychedelics are again increasingly scientifically examined for the treatment of mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Clinical trials with MDMA and psilocybin in particular have gained momentum, I'm making here. that these substances I'm here. be approved for drug-assisted psychotherapy in the US and in Europe over the next few years. But when and how the medicalization of psychedelics will take place? We are coming together in this session to hear more about and discuss the advent of psychedelic prescription medicine in Europe. I have envisioned this session as a science vision quest. In Native American cultures, a vision quest refers to a rite of passage consisting of specific ceremonies conducted by elders that usually young members of a community undergo to enter into adulthood. During a time of fasting, they are sent to sacred sites in the wilderness where they ask spirit guides for a vision to reveal their life's purpose and the way they can best serve their community. Rather than depending on food deprivation and isolation, this science vision quest seeks to gather a mix of visionaries, movers and builders from the interdisciplinary field of psychedelic science to imagine psychedelic research and its coming of age story. We are convened here today to envision and critically reflect upon how psychedelics can be responsibly reintegrated into European mental health systems and our culture more broadly. As the second part of the ease of 2020 motto indicates, 
Science for freedom is equally important as freedom for science. The re-emerging psychedelic research field and wider psychedelic communities in Europe and the US are currently struggling with how to make themselves more inclusive for people of any gender and color and how to create safe and supporting spaces for the integration of psych uh, for the ingestion and integration of experiences with psychedelics. Currently, studies with psilocybin in particular show that psychedelic experiences often turn out as portals into a mystical dimension of existence, where the unity of life is encountered in awe-inspiring moments that hint at the possibility of liberation from a variety of society-imposed constraints. How to harness this potential inherent in psychedelic experiences and thus practice psychedelic science as a means for freedom is another challenge that psychedelic researchers encounter today and that the speakers in this session may help us grapple with. I am really excited to have a wonderful um, panel with four wonderful speakers convened today. And yeah, I'm super uh, curious to hear what they all have to say about the current state of psychedelic prescription medicine in Europe on, and what they envision for the future. And uh, we from each of, ten, of them. And uh, yeah, we will start with Rosalind Watts. Um, she is a clinical psychologist, a psychotherapist and uh, the clinical lead of the psilocybin for depression trial at Imperial College London. She is now, uh, I've heard, also clinical director at Synthesis, uh, which is a retreat and research center in Amsterdam. And um, she has developed a psychedelic therapy model called Accept, Connect, Embody, and the Psychometric Measure for Connectedness, which her qualitative research identified as a potential mechanism of therapeutic change in psychedelic uh, approaches. Rosalind uh, also co-facilitates a monthly integration group for people who are attending psychedelic ceremonies for therapeutic purposes. And yeah, I've, I see also Rick has joined, so we are complete. And yeah, Ross, I'm giving over to you and looking forward to what you have to say about your research and your visions. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, lovely to be here. Um, I don't have any slides. I actually wrote, I woke up this morning and I wrote from the heart. Um, yeah, I just kind of really wrote what I, what I believe. So I'm actually just going to read it out. Um, it means a lot to me, this, this topic. It really does. Um, yeah. So, so I've spent the last five years at the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London, headed by Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt, and they really have pioneered the neuroscientific investigation of psilocybin as a treatment for depression. And they have, um, they have provided the framework for two really important clinical trials. Um, and in that context, I was able to develop what was essentially a prototype for a psilocybin therapy clinic. So I worked with an amazing clinical team. There were six of us. We kind of lived and breathed together for two years and, and really devoted everything to this work. And we really, we really, felt that we were kind of in the flow of a psychedelic therapy clinic we in the year um, 2019 to 2020 we we conducted over 100 psilocybin therapy sessions um, and as part of psilodep 2 which was the second psilocybin for depression study and we really refined the therapy model which you referred to claudia the accept connect embody model um, the results of our second study will be out quite soon i can't say anything about them yet but i'm very very happy with how the study went um, and we all learned so much from it. Um, the, the Accept Connect and Body therapy um, framework which we developed there um, is really uses the analogy of psilocybin treatment as like like you say like a vision quest it's, it's a journey and the idea the, the framework we use is that a psilocybin treatment session can be like diving for pearls. So imagine that you're swimming in the sea and then you dive down below the surface of the sea you dive down out of the head into the body and you dive down into the deepest layers of yourself. And you dive down to the murky waters, the places that you might sometimes want to avoid in yourself, the shadowy places, 
and you dive towards the dark spiky things and you open them up. Rather than swimming away from them, you see those spiky oyster shells and you swim towards them and you open them up. You open up to what you can learn from those places. And sometimes when you really sit with the pain and the shame that those places hold, you find a pearl. And that pearl is the lesson in your pain. It's the lesson that your pain teaches you about what is most important. It, it teaches you about your values. And when you find that pearl, you swim up to the surface of the sea and holding that pearl in your hand, you look around and you see the whole world. You see the horizon, the sky, and you feel a sense of expansion, a sense of connection to values and meaning. So in the five years um, at the center, I, I come to feel that psilocybin is not a drug that treats the symptoms of depression, um, but that it is a tool that can enable people who have been very shut down to open up. It can help people grow. But this opening up and growth process is very nuanced and very complex. Psilocybin can enable people to really feel their emotions, really connect to meaning and values, and this sense of expansion. But if it is not followed up with therapy and support, the sense of expansion contracts after a while, and people can feel worse than they did before. Psilocybin treatment can also increase anxiety. It's very good at decreasing the symptoms of depression straight away usually, and people can really feel that their depression has gone almost overnight. But often in that early period after psilocybin treatment, people feel more anxious, they feel more sensitive, they feel raw, they feel kind of tender, thin skinned, and it can be quite disruptive and sudden in their lives. Without the social structures to support this kind of change, it can be very overwhelming for people, especially if they feel isolated without a community of people to support this kind of work. So for both of these reasons, number one, that the depression reduction is temporary without further support and further therapy. And number two, that people can feel very sensitive and raw after psilocybin treatment. I've come to really feel the importance of integration, this follow-up therapy after a session, and having a community of people to do this integration work in. So in the study, in the psilocybin for depression study that we just completed, when COVID happened, the last kind of people in our, in our study were not able to access their integration, their follow-up therapy, because they couldn't come to the clinic. So what we did is we set up an online integration group for the participants of the study to meet each other. And this doesn't normally happen in studies, the participants don't normally meet each other, but we connected them with each other. And what happened, is, and it's still happening now by them, the facilitation from us has stopped, but the group has continued to meet is this very active community of people going on this journey of acceptance, connection, embodiment, doing the work, going through the expansions, the contractions, sitting with the painful emotions, connecting to their values, they're doing it together as a community. And it was really important for them because some of them were really struggling without a community of people to do this work in. Um, and they, they talked about how they needed further treatment, that they'd had this opening, but that the depression had come back and they wanted to access further treatment and that they needed a community of people to support them and they needed integration therapy too. So I have, um, as you mentioned, Claudia, I've, I've, I've joined Synthesis as clinical director and the, and the purpose of this is to set up a therapy program, the kind of therapy program that our imperial study participants have asked for that they wanted. And... <clears throat> It's, it's really been wonderful watching the, the team um, develop, the clinical team develop. We've, uh, we have uh, Maria Papaspiru and, and Tim Reed, Michelle Baker-Jones, many of the uh, kind of leading psychedelic therapists in the field um, joining together to provide this kind of ongoing care that we feel that people with depression embarking on this kind of work can really benefit from. So the, um, the, the way we're going to work is we're going to provide this longer term therapeutic program. So it's a 15 month program. So when people join, this can be people with depression, when they join our clinical program or therapeutic program at Synthesis, they will, they will be formed into small groups. So small groups of eight people. And within that structure, they will be able to, um, to have a therapeutic experience as a group doing preparation work over a, over a number of weeks, couple of months. And then they come to the Netherlands and then they have the, their process of therapeutic process in the Netherlands. 
And after that, this small group will then be taken on a kind of long integration journey together. It's a year long integration program. And what we hope is that as each group of people come to this therapeutic program, each group of people will then join an online integration community. So as each group of eight comes through, they will join this ever expanding group of people and they will also do some work in their small group. So it's this idea of a group of eight that have really bonded together, they've been through this process together and they maintain this process together for a long period of time. And then there's also this wider community of people too. So there's the small group and then there's the larger group. And this is because we want to start building this kind of psych psychedelic therapy community. So Synthesis is a, is a for-profit company. Um, our, our motivation is, is to provide the infrastructure needed to provide people with depression access to this kind of therapy and to start building this kind of global community. And we're working on ways to expand access, scholarship funds, and I am working very closely with USONA and also um, a, a economics professor called Bennett Zellner. So Bennett Zellner has been developing something called the pollinator model. Now the pollinator model is, he's doing this work in his, um, in his role with USONA. So USONA are a manufacturer of psilocybin. They're a not-for-profit manufacturer of psilocybin. And they're working together with Bennett to develop this idea. So within this model, um, psychedelic therapy would be delivered to the community via community wellness centers. So these would be community centers that are set up by a community for a community using this not-for-profit psilocybin and various different programs could happen there, wellness programs, therapy programs. And this kind of model is really very much in, in contrast to existing pharmaceutical models which treat individual distress using a, a, a drug, a medication, and they don't pay much attention to the relationship between the individual and the community within which they live, the environmental factors. This is really looking at the relationship between individual and community wellness. It's, it's looking at how this ecological principle of pollination can help individuals and communities thrive. So the, the idea of pollination in, in terms of bees and how it works in our ecosystem is that the production of well-being depends on the continual renewal and recirculation of resources within a system. So the pollinator model suggests that local set up centers set up by a community for a community will employ local therapists, will, will treat the local community, whatever it is that they need, whatever the trauma footprint of that place is, those needs will be provided for by different therapies in, involving psychedelics. And then after people have had the psychedelic treatment and they feel the sense of opening that they so often feel, there will be community stakeholders present. So employers, local employers will be there. There will be people involved in local ecological restoration projects. So you have your psychedelic experience and then you can be linked up to someone that can offer you a job or you can be linked up to people that are doing some tree planting in your local community or doing some other kind of community healing project. And so I think this has a lot of promise for the healing of individuals and communities. And the, the idea with this model is that it won't be funded by startup capital, but it will be what Bennett is working on is looking into these new models of financing, ownership, governance, to allow such a model to, to flourish and thrive with this idea that psilocybin is the pollen. Psilocybin is the pollen that is going to provide this growth in this, in this ecosystem. So, yeah, I'm very interested in these nature metaphors and actually the new model, I've developed a new model um, and it will all be published open, open source like my last Accept Connect and Body model was, was published. I'll be publishing the update as well when I can. Um, and it's called Accept, Connect, Embody, Restore. So I've added an R on the end. And the R is this longer term, year long integration process, which is all about restoration with the cycles of nature. Um, and, and developing an ecosystem as well. So one last nature metaphor that I would like to use um, is, is relating to my concerns about the future of psychedelic therapy and how it's delivered and how it's accessed. So I want to think about the seeds that we are planting because as we plant this ecosystem, tiny differences in the seeds we plant will make a huge difference later on. So like an acorn grows into a huge oak, the blueprint for that mighty oak is embedded in that tiny acorn. 
And so we need to think very carefully about the seeds that we plant from the outset, because the differences in the seeds will determine whether we grow a healthy ecosystem that supports diversity or a monoculture, which destroys the soil and makes a few people very rich. So there are two main providers of GMP psilocybin. One is for profit and one is not for profit. In the psychedelic community, we have created a kind of contract. It's called the Statement on Open Science and Open Praxis with psilocybin, MDMA and similar substances. And this is really for organizations and companies to sign up to, to try and build a healthy ecosystem based on collaborating and interconnection, growth, mutual support, sharing knowledge, sharing findings. And as far as I'm aware that the for-profit psilocybin manufacturing company has not signed this statement. And I, I really hope that they do in future. This company, they're called Compass Pathways, have also been granted a patent relating to methods of treating treatment resistant depression with a psilocybin formulation. And in response, the not-for-profit psilocybin manufacturer, USONA, announced an anti-patent. So that's, they shared a publication of an improved process for synthesizing psilocybin openly and I am very grateful to the work USONA are doing to uphold these values of openness, collaboration and sharing. And I would like to think that in the future, we can as a community ensure that we have real transparency, that we really uphold transparency. Ooh. Am I, ooh, something just popped up. Have you still got me? Um, that, we, that we can really ensure transparency and that's about whether scientists investigating psilocybin, whatever the manufacturing source, whether they've been given shares or large sums of money by that company. Now, I have no idea whether this has ever happened, but I think we need to make sure that we bring in a rule that if it ever does happen, there would be transparency about it, because this is the kind of practice that happens in, in Big Pharma, and it is the kind of practice that we ourselves will be vulnerable to. I also don't think that providers of GMP psilocybin should be able to dictate to scientists what they can and can't say. I think the contracts that a psilocybin manufacturing company has with an academic institution should be very carefully studied. And if the terms are unacceptable and run counter to open science, then they must be contested. So I think, yeah, there's, I have a lot, a lot more I could say, but I think that's probably my time up. And I'm very, very keen to hear the other panelists and, and for our debate afterwards. So yeah, that's, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ross, for your really interesting perspective and also your, your youth uh, articulating your own values and what you think is important for the flourishing of psychedelic research and the broader culture and all of the different communities and yeah thanks also for the nature metaphors and for connecting us back to nature in, in that way so that's also really beautiful um, yeah let's move on now please collect all your, of your questions comments uh, and uh, send, send them to me and I will come back to them later then in the discussion session but now let's move on to Rick Doblin. Rick uh, is undoubtedly one of the heroes of the psychedelic renaissance we are currently undergoing. He is the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, an organization that has been committed to rebooting and legitimizing psychedelic research since the mid 80s. He received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and has also uh, done his uh, master's there. His professional goal is to develop legal contexts for the beneficial uses of psychedelics and marijuana, primarily, primarily as prescription medicines, but also for personal growth for otherwise healthy people. And eventually he has the vision for himself to become a legally licensed psychedel psychedelic therapist. Also a big thank you to Rick for joining live. Um, Rick and Bia, who will speak later, are based in, in the US and it's really very early there. So I want to thank you both so much for getting up and show, uh, showering us with your live presence. This means so much to me and to all of us, I think. So, uh, yeah, I'm handing over to you, Rick. We are really curious what you have 
let's just say, and report from the frontier of uh, bringing NVMe back um, to the people and what you have envisioned for psychedelic prescription medicines and especially what you envision for Europe. Yes, well, thank you for having me. Raza, it was very nice to hear your presentation. Um, I just wanted to comment, um, I will need to share my screen because I, I do have uh, some slides, but um, I wanna say we're also working with Bennett Zellner and the, the main uh, key there I think is that the um, local ownership of clinics as opposed to um, a corporation that would own hundreds or potentially even thousands of clinics in some sort of other model. Um, and also, Raz, I just would like maybe in the discussion to talk more about this sense that you had about the one session model that that often the depression comes back. And so it, it does seem to me that, um, you know, the models that we need are going to need to um, acknowledge. Yeah, that um, much as we would like to hope for a one dose miracle cure, that that's not often. Sometimes it does work that way, but not that often. And that, uh, you know two sessions, three sessions, and then this long period of integration. But I think the, the challenge is going to be um, how do you work through regulatory agencies? I mean, they're going to be looking at your results after one session or two session. They're not going to probably look at after this, um, you know, 15 month or whatever long process that, that you have at synthesis. So how do we most, most get it approved, but then acknowledge that people need more sometimes than that? All right, so if I can um, share my screen. Um, so as, as Claudia said, we um, were started in 1986 um, after MDMA was criminalized in 85. And it took us 30 years to go through phase two and to have the end of phase two meeting with FDA. So I won't uh, belabor what happened during those 30 years, but it was a lot of work and a lot of political resistance. And it was also at a point where uh, there were no investors. It was only working in a nonprofit context. Um, so the results that we presented to the FDA from our phase two data, which was from 107 patients from small phase two studies in the United States, Israel, Switzerland, and Canada, were that the treatment that we have developed is about a three and a half month long treatment where people get MDMA three times, uh, once a month, more or less three to five weeks apart in eight hour long sessions with male, female teams. Uh, it can be two females, can be two males, can be people that don't identify with genders, but in general, it's been uh, male, female teams. And in addition to the three day long MDMA sessions, there's also 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. Um, three before the first MDMA session for uh, preparation and developing the therapeutic alliance, and then uh, three after each MDMA session for integration. So we're trying to develop a package that, that will both have long-term benefits and also will um, be uh, approvable by regulatory agencies. And so what we showed in the placebo group, and I, I should say that the placebo group is, is not like when you think about a normal placebo, this is really therapy without active MDMA. So it's 42 hours of therapy. So it's not really a placebo, it's um, therapy. And what we demonstrate is that the two month follow-up after the last day long um, experimental session, um, the reason we picked two months is because we want to avoid the criticism that this is part of a psychedelic afterglow that people are in this um, period of time, but um, after the psychedelic experiences, but then it, it fades, you know, and, and Raz, I'd like to look forward to talking to you more about this sense about how long it takes to fade often for most people. But we feel that at the two month follow up, you're really looking at a longer term um, effects. And so what we showed is that 23% of the hardest cases, we felt that because MDMA is so controversial, the whole field of psychedelics was, was much more controversial than it is now, we needed to work with the hardest cases. And so we worked with chronic, on average, severe treatment resistant uh, PTSD patients. And also 
unlike a lot of research with PTSD, we have been willing to enroll people who have attempted suicide in the past. A lot of times people who have actually attempted to kill themselves are excluded from studies. But, so we include the hardest cases and we show that at the two month follow-up um, with the people that had uh, therapy with either no MDMA or a low dose inactive MDMA, uh, not inactive completely, but uh, not therapeutically active, that 23% um, no longer had PTSD. So that's actually really good. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me get, yeah, that's really good for um, this patient population. Um, but when you add MDMA, it gets to be uh, more than double. 56% no longer have PTSD at the end of the two-month follow-up. And this is with therapy plus uh, therapeutic doses of MDMA. Um, now, this, these uh, two-month data is what's going to be used by FDA and European medicines agencies to evaluate the data and to see about whether to approve the drug therapy combination. But particularly in Europe, where there's national healthcare systems, and also in the U.S., where there's insurance companies, we really want to make sure that the insurance companies will cover it. Um, and so we do a 12 month follow up. Now, after the two month follow up, we don't do any more therapy with people. So, whatever they do is up to them. They can go back to therapy, they can uh, start new kinds of therapy. So, what we, we can't say that the results at the 12 month follow up are due entirely to our therapy, but we are able to say that our therapy may have motivated people to, to do other things. But what we show at the 12 month follow up, is that uh, two thirds now no longer have PTSD. And of the one third that still does PTSD, almost all of them, but not all of them, have had clinically significant reductions in PTSD symptoms. And if we would have been able to give a fourth session, potentially a fifth session, uh, they might also fall below the level of having a diagnosis with PTSD. So I, I don't mean to imply that this one third um, is without hope, doesn't experience any benefits. Um, so these are tremendous results. And on the basis uh, of these results, um, the FDA uh, permitted us to go to phase three and declared uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD a breakthrough therapy. And the breakthrough therapy is um, a highly coveted designation um, Pharma wants to get it, of course, because you have um, expedited timelines, more meetings with FDA. And um, of the applications from pharma to have drugs declared breakthrough therapy, uh, roughly uh, two thirds are rejected. So only one third is really approved as breakthrough therapy. So what we were approved to do was um, two uh, phase three studies, each with a hundred person. And so we call them map one and map two. And we were also permitted, which is pretty amazing to do what's called an interim analysis, which uh, for what's called sample size re-estimation. So when you develop your power calculations, you look at your phase two data, you try to design your phase three studies. Um, you have some ideas about the effect size um, about the variability, and you come up with a uh, number of people to put into the studies. And what you're able to do with the interim analysis is have an unblinded data monitoring committee that's just a few people that looks at the data. We negotiated with FDA that it would be after 60% or 60 people of the 100 had reached their primary outcome measure and all 100 had been enrolled. And what FDA has also said to us is that they believe that we can demonstrate efficacy uh, with fewer people than they want to see for safety. So sometimes in large studies, when an interim analysis is conducted, if the results are so great, um, one of the responses you could get is that you um, can end the study early because then it's no longer ethical in a way to uh, have people in the placebo group. But we do not have that option to end the studies early because the FDA wants to see um, more subjects for safety. So this was what we were putting. Now the interim analysis 
we set the uh, probability of statistical significance at 90%. Um, and we sized it for that at a, a medium effect size. And so when you get the results of the interim analysis, um, you are either told um, continue the study unchanged. So all I get really is a number. I don't get to see, and MAPS staff doesn't get to see any of the raw data. All we get is a number and the number is either zero, you don't need to add anybody, you're great on track, or you need to add a certain number of people to increase the statistical power. FDA will approve the drugs and EMA will approve the drugs based on statistical significance, not based on effect size. They figure that uh, the marketplace will sort it out. If it's statistically significant, and again, you're looking at groups, maybe one day you'll figure out that some of the people respond better than others and you'll just give it to those people that are more likely to respond. Um, but you are permitted to add more people, which means that overall your effect size is not as good as, uh, as you had hoped. Or you're told to stop the study for safety or futility reasons. It's too dangerous. The safety profile in your experimental group is much worse than the safety profile in the others. Or that uh, your data is just uh, not good enough and it's not gonna work. Um, there have been two drugs that have been approved by um, FDA as breakthrough therapy for PTSD. One is uh, MDMA, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. The other was a, sleep, a repurposed sleeping pill from over 30 years ago called Tan Maya. And it was being pursued by a Tonix pharmaceutical company. and. Tonix had its uh, interim analysis in February of this year, and they were told to stop the study for futility after they had spent well over $100 million. Um, you could say invested or you could say lost. Um, they were hoping that by um, facilitating sleep, they would reduce nightmares and that would have a significant effect on PTSD symptoms. But that did not work. So what that means, though, for people to understand is that you can have a breakthrough therapy and you can be in phase three and you can still fail. Uh, now, that fortunately did not happen to us. The results of our interim analysis were such that we were told that um, we were doing great, that we did not need to add anybody to the study, that we had at least a 90 percent or greater probability that we would generate statistically significant results. And so I've uh, considered this uh, the most important reality check in MAPS's 34 year history. And um, as we had anticipated, as we had hoped, um, it turned out great. So that took place in March of uh, this year. Now, right after March, um, you know, as you heard from Ross also about COVID stopping their studies, we had the same thing happen um, to us. And some of the therapists were willing to continue with some of the patients in process, some were not, some of the patients were not willing to continue. And so the FDA saw this happening to not just us, but to all sorts of research that was being conducted. And so they reached out to some of the sponsors and they said, because of COVID, would you be willing to negotiate with us to end the study early? Um, and the challenge is that if you end the study early with fewer subjects, you have less likelihood of statistical significance. The more subjects you have, the more likely you are to have statistical significance. So um, faced with the probability though of, of having to either just uh, start up the study again way later, or, and then it might be a different background environment, a lot more anxiety and uh, depression caused by COVID. So we negotiate with FDA and we came to agreement that we would end the study when 90 participants had completed at least one outcome measure, which means they might not have all completed the three MDMA sessions, but at least they had one baseline measure and they had one experimental session and at least one outcome measure. So we um, completed, we came to agreement with FDA on the 90 participants and then we, um, completed all the treatments by the end of July. And so now um, we are um, doing data cleaning, data lock, data monitoring, and we will have the information from our first of two uh, phase three studies um, 
by uh, the end of September. So that will be the most important reality check. We're, we're very hopeful it'll, it'll work out well. Um, we have also negotiated with the European Medicines Agency. So we've had a series of meetings with their scientific advice uh, working party. And the good news is that the EMA has decided that the protocol designs that we've developed for FDA are acceptable to them. And that's particularly challenging because of the um, concerns about double blind and how we recognize that really it's not gonna, there is no way to do a successful double blind study um, with psychedelics, um, particularly with MDMA. So um, they agreed that they would accept the FDA data and they said that we only needed to do one phase three study in Europe and that it would be only needing to be a minimum of 70 subjects. And we could spread that out over several, seven countries in Europe. They wanted a geographical distribution of countries in Europe. And one thing that we were particularly pleased with is that the EMA encouraged us to enroll refugees and migrants in the study as well, because there are hundreds of thousands, millions now of these refugees and migrants that are um, highly traumatized in the countries of origin. And they're also, uh, because of the trauma, having a difficult time being integrated into the countries that they um, have fled to. And so the EMA recognized that. And then if we could help reduce the uh, PTSD in this population, then their lives might be a whole lot easier. So of these 70 subjects, we're thinking somewhere around 10 of them or so will be um, refugees or migrants. Um, so we are working in seven different countries, uh, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Germany, England, uh, Finland, uh, Portugal, and uh, we have since added Norway as well. Um, and we'll have about 10 different sites. Um, the way in which we are now uh, starting, uh, and I'm happy that Eric is here because uh, the Netherlands is where we're gonna start first. So. Part of our therapy training program to train the therapists is um, we have a whole sequence of uh, training program elements. Um, there's an online component. Then there used to be a, a one week in person uh, component, watching videotapes and watching therapy sessions. Then there's um, the opportunity for therapists to volunteer themselves to receive MDMA um, in a therapeutic setting. And, and Russ, I'd be curious to talk to you about this also about the role of um, training therapists, whether, you know, giving them psilocybin, that opportunity or, or not, how you see that, whether that's important or not. Um, I know that Compass doesn't think it's important to have their people have psilocybin, but in any case, there's the opportunity to volunteer for a protocol to take MDMA, then they do role play, um, which are videotaped and reviewed by our therapy training Thing. And then the final step of the training is a phase two open label study with the exact same design that we would use in phase three. And then people would go ahead and um, work with a PTSD patient under supervision from our therapy training team. So the start dates here for the work in Europe are um, the start dates for the phase two study for this um, open label phase two study for the final purpose of training the therapist. And so you can see that we hope by um, uh, the end of um, February, 2021, that we will have started in all the different countries with the various uh, therapists. Now, this, these are projections. We're not sure that we'll be able to make these dates, but, but we hope so. Now, the other part that's gonna be very important for Europe in particular is going to be um, negotiating with the national healthcare services about whether they will um, cover the cost of treatment and they're gonna look at cost effectiveness studies. So we're working with Elliot Marseille, who's an expert in um, cost effectiveness studies. And he's looked at our phase two data and what he's determined that um, it is uh, cost effective in a um, uh, break even after three and a half years after MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So we think that the data will be sufficient to persuade the um, regulatory agencies uh, both to 
you know, we have done that to permit the research, but to persuade the national healthcare services to actually pay for it. And then how does this get distributed? It'll be distributed in these clinics. We hope that it will be following the pollinator model. Um, but I think the other thing to say here is that these clinics are going to be composed of therapists who want to be cross-trained in psilocybin, ketamine, MDMA, and other things. So it's not going to be, here's some MDMA clinic, here's a psilocybin clinic, over there's a ketamine clinic. It's really going to be um, psychedelic psychotherapy. And the therapists will be able to use their intuition and their knowledge to customize treatments for their particular patients. So that, that's the introduction that I have for the morning. And uh, thank you all for your time. And I look forward to more of the questions. And um, But I, I do think that uh, in many different ways, psychedelic psychotherapy is coming to Europe. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing it to Europe, uh, we have to say. Um, yeah, so let's follow up with um, Eric, um, who's uh, also working with you in Europe. Uh, Professor Eric Vermetten is a clinical psychiatrist working with veterans and other uniformed officers, uh, also with the Dutch Ministry of Defense. He holds an endowed chair in psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry at Leiden University. He's trained in psychiatry and neuroscience and as part of his clinical and research positions, he's focused on complex psychotrauma in military and civilian populations. And his research is particularly on stress, trauma, complex PTSD, and neuroscience. And now he aims to combine biological-based interventions with novel technology and drug developments, in particular MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, and medical cannabis. Eric, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Claudia. It's a, it's very enjoyable to listen to Rosalind and to to Rick, and and I, I was going to say being here, but I'm home, so being not there or so, or <laughs> we're all disconnected, and I never get used to this. So. Um, what I want to do is um, is uh, talk a bit about my work in psychedelics, and actually a couple of questions that Claudia you you posted to us that I will cover briefly: the challenges in Europe, the difference with the U.S., risk minimization, scaling, the vision for science in the next couple of, a couple of ten years or so, creation of spaces, people of color, paradigm shift, molding into a biological biomedical model and probably broadening the horizon. Claudia prompted us with, with some topics that we, we, we may be able to address. And, and initially, uh, to get started, I'll give you a heads up, and, and you already alluded to, to, to my role. I have different hats. I wear this, this professorial hat sometimes and also wear the military hat. My affiliations are at Leiden and also at the ARC National Psychotrauma Center, which is a, a center of excellence in, in Amsterdam in, in, uh, in, uh, near to Leiden and I work for the Ministry of Defense. Now I hold a clinical position as well. So may, most of my, my, my patients are, are active duty military uh, soldiers, uniformed professionals or, or veterans. This is another, another group of people that I'd like to introduce. Uh, they would have loved to come to Trieste or so, but they, they, they cannot make it. These, this is the Dutch team of uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy with an added on. Here's Michael Miethofer. And if I, if I can use, you see my cursor, the Michael Miethofer and Annie Miethofer. And these are the people that have been trained uh, in, in, a, in a psychotherapy session or sponsored by MAPS. When was this, Rick? Uh, at the end of uh, 2018. But they were not the only ones that were trained in, in MDMA assisted psychotherapy. This was, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is when we were approved uh, by the uh, by the um, by the uh, board of directors that we got and and by the regulatory agencies that we uh, were allowed to import our MDMA and you see the the uh, the, the the joy that we uh, we had while we were waiting for the MDMA to uh, to arrive, but this is the the broader team and and you see this is uh, I think. Uh, um, 70 or 80 people actually who came from all over Europe and, and Rick, you nicely outlined the centers that are taking part in the phase two, phase three trials. Here you see their teams lumped up on these staircases where they were coming to the Netherlands, the south of the Netherlands to have an in-week training for, for five to seven days 
and um, and you see the Czech Republic, the Berlin people, and and the, and, and the the various group that have come together. And this was a year and a half uh, uh, ago, but uh, we're still we're still strong and getting stronger. Um, so we're talking actually, Claudia, and, and great for putting this together. We're talking about a psychedelic renaissance. That's a no-brainer, actually. What we're in for the last maybe five or so, or a little over years. This is a beautiful documentary that was shot by Andries de Smet and Robin de uh, Van Nuffel, two Belgian filmmakers. If you Vimeo it or so, you can see it. It's I think it's subtitled or it's even in, Eng in English. It's called the psychedelic renaissance. But I wanted to take you a little bit back in history because why I'm in this field is, is probably because of one person that has devoted much of his time in working with LSD in concentration camp survivors. Now, when our country was liberated after the Second World War, we were confronted with a lot of people who came back from the camps. And uh, Jan Bastians was a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University Medical Center who, um, who saw that. And we didn't have a concept of PTSD at that time. This was pre-PTSD. It was pre-concept of what the impact of trauma really was. And he saw these people, they were isolated in their, in their rooms and in their in themselves and they couldn't get out of it. They couldn't, they, they were so isolated. And um, he developed this, this, this uh, treatment with LSD. Where he was a pioneer in his time where he explored not only, uh, not only the compounds like pentatol in, in the, in the post-war period, but also, also LSD. And he wrote this beautiful book almost at the end of his career, Isolation and Liberation. And these people were not liberated. They were mentally in their, in their brain and in their, themselves. And, um, and if you go to the Hall of Fame at the Department of Psychiatry at Leiden University Medical Center, you see, you see him there. That's Jan Bastians. And it, an interesting book that I could recommend you to, to, to read or so was by Ye Yehil de Nur. He was an Israeli writer. He was in, um, in Auschwitz. He's a very well-known Israeli uh, novelist, and he was captured in Auschwitz, and he was there for, um, and after 30 years, he, he was still suffering from these nightmares of the camps, and he sought help in the late 70s by Jan Bastians, and he beautifully writes in his book, Shividi, how he, um, how he was cured by a couple of sessions with LSD. And a brief vignette of this is he, he in, in, in his nightmares, or actually when he was in the camp, he never wanted to die. So he felt that he was the protector for all the people who were in the camps. And these nightmares were about that. But when he had his LSD experience, he kind of had this unifying experience where the smoke from the chimneys was not the devil, but he saw that that was man's creation. And, and the, the, the experience of a unifying, actually a near death experience, maybe an ego dissolution, uh, uh, helped him to, to let go and to, to, to be recovered from his nightmares. That's, he, he beautifully writes about his sessions uh, with Jan Bastians, and I can highly re recommend that. And what you see here on the left is when he was in a Nuremberg trials, you know, these, these trials were, were devastating and he couldn't stand it, so he collapsed. During those um, during those trials, I'm not going to show this, but there is footage about Bastians where on the treatments there's a beautiful documentary shot. Do you understand why I'm crying? And this is a documentary of the late '60s where you can see what actually a session. This is over 50 years ago. Looked like. Oops. So. I'm going to briefly highlight for one minute what drove me into this field and a couple of key people that have contributed to why I think that this is really important. One of them is John Crystal. John Crystal is a professor of psychiatry at Yale University of Medicine and, and, um, and in Yale, New Haven, uh, the US. And he wrote about the crisis in the psychopharmacology or the pharmacotherapy for PTSD. He's an editor of, the, of biological psychiatry. And he wrote two years ago, it is time to address the crisis in the pharmacotherapy of PTSD. And what did he say? We don't have drugs for the treatment of PTSD. We only have two, sertraline and, and, um, and paroxetine. But for the rest, the research has stalled. We don't have any novel compounds. And that, that was picked up and so why don't we have any novel compounds? And the recommendation, actually, we need to think out of the box. There are drugs that we stalled or so. So that that's, was an incentive to look to look outside of the box. 
Another one is uh, Boris Heifetz. Boris Heifetz is an anesthesiologist in, um, in Stanford, and he wrote a beautiful piece about a year ago on disruptive psychopharmacology. With, uh, with Robert Malenka. And he wrote about ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin. And he said, these are distinct compounds. What, what they do actually, they have, a, they, they look at, he called them disruptive pathways. Pathways that we are not familiar to look at from a, from a pharmacological perspective. Now I can highly recommend to look at look at that paper as well. That, that, that's number two. The third one, actually, you mentioned him, all, him already. Rosalind is is our, our another big hero. Is is David Nutt, who for years, when he was in Bristol and later when he moved to 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 and uh, to Imperial, wrote about the importance of recognizing medical marijuana, MDMA, and and psilocybin. And this just recently came out. Uh, a, a commentary in Cell about uh, psychedelic psychiatry's brave new world. And he, he asks like, wh why, why this revolution in psychiatry? So I can highly recommend you to read that. And the fourth, of course, it's a no brainer. When I was looking at this slide and Rick, it's, it's, it's a beautiful slide where, where Michael, Michael Miethofer uh, reported this. this. This is the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trial, 2001, it was published. And you see here the slope. And I just wanted to show you again, the ones in the audience that have not seen this yet. You see, this is a beautiful slope where you treat patients with placebo in this assisted psychotherapy session and they go from 80, this is caps four to 60 and you have a signal. But when you see what happens when they get MDMA and this, when I saw this four or five years ago, it blew me away. And either you think it's not true or it's too good to be true. And it is true because you can't tear this paper apart. You can't tear the study apart. It's so well thought through and so beautifully outlined and it carries a message, a strong message that is not trivial. So we're really, quote unquote, curing, curing patients from PTSD. So that needed a follow-up. And I felt a moral incentive to see like, if this is a signal and this is something we can give to our patients, we have to, we're, we're morally obliged actually to, to pursue this. So, so we're talking and I'm, I'm my focus, I know that is psychotraumatology is PTSD. And, um, and, and let's look in with, within PTSD for a moment. And we have, we have not only PTSD or not only MDMA, we have four compounds that are potentially promising. And we just wrote a, a review about this. It's MDMA, I know it's small letters, it's MDMA, it's also ketamine. It's not a psychedelic. Some people say it's not a psychedelic, it's a dissociated drug. It's a really different drug. And you have the classical ones like psilocybin and then you have can 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 Now, what is important to address, and I just want to say it, we have to think about administration of the compounds. Some of them are IV, some of them are orally, intranasally, some are so so these drugs are not delivered in the same way. Dosages vary. This is really important. And what we also need to, to acknowledge is a setting. And the setting is an important part because we can't just give this to some centers or so. The setting is a really important infrastructure that we have to take into account to, to be acknowledged as a, probably a contributing to a therapeutic uh, effect. And then we have to discuss the evidence that we're currently at in these different compounds. Now, with, with some PhDs of mine, Aaron Kredit, we reviewed these, these uh, compounds, uh, how, where, where the, the research is lately. And also we have started, actually I started for the last two years of providing medical marijuana to patients with chronic PTSD. And, and I see a signal that, that they like it. It's not only that they like it, their nightmares sort of subside and they're less irritable the next day. And they feel that they, um, they wanted to um, continue the use of, um, of, of medical marijuana, which is not a psychedelic per se, but it's sort of discussed within the same realm. Another thing that just recently came out, and we're a small country, but this is important for, for the Netherlands, a whole issue of the Journal of Psychiatry, the Dutch Journal of Psychiatry was devoted to psychedelics. That has never happened in history before. These are all papers in our monthly journal that are uh, about uh, uh, psychedelics. I just recently posted by the University of, Med of the Netherlands uh, a clip, uh, a sort of a TED talk, how does MDMA assist veterans in treating their trauma? You can Google it or so. It's, it's in Dutch if you wanted to see it. It's, it's very well received. Probably we're subtitling it, it in, in English. Actually, with the help of you, Rick, we're, uh, we're, we're going to, uh, to, to do that. 
And of course, as, as Claudia, as you said, we are starting, we're one of the centers that are started with a phase two, phase three trial. And you've seen my team. And of course, we're doing their imaging before and after to really look at, do we get a signal in the amygdala? Is the amygdala less active or so that is this, this, this um, combat driven uh, sensitization model is actually uh, reduced in the, in the uh, post-treatment analysis of, um, of, um, of patients with PTSD. Oops. So, whoops. So the psychedelic status that we have, we have four compounds probably that are at stake. that are very interesting. MDMA, ketamine or esketamine, psilocybin and cannabis. The sponsors are different for each drug. We're talking about MAPS for MDMA. Esketamine has several sponsors and some don't even have sponsors. We, we have Janssen with the oral esketamine that's on the market. We don't see it in Europe yet. It's very costly. So you see all these ketamine clinics, then you see a lot of, of, of reports about it. People are, are not happy with what we see. Probably we'll see it in Europe in the next three or four years that there's a couple of private enterprises with these ketamine clinics that are just going to get in for the ketamine. I see that as a worrisome development because I feel that the, the, the impact of ketamine as what we're, we are discussing as a compound that you need to integrate the experience of needs to be recognized. And I feel that that's not being taken seriously. That's, that is a concern that I have. So we might, we might lose, the, lose the effects. And psilocybin, we, of course, we see Compass. That's, that's a big player, USONA and, 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 um, and Beckley. And in cannabis, there are several uh, players in this. And, and their stakes are high. And some people have invested in cannabis and lost a lot of money because of different. But um, what we also see is the indications uh, vary. It is PTSD, it's autism, it's couples therapy, it's pain, depression, sleep. Um, and, and, and one of the things we may learn is that we have to think also out of the box from a disease model if we look at effectivity of these, of these compounds. Uh, DSM provides us all these, these tick boxes or so, but maybe for really valuing the effect of the psychedelic, uh, psychedelic uh, uh, compounds, we have to look beyond, beyond these uh, disease models as well. Now, this is the infrastructure for those who are not familiar, this is Michael and Annie's infrastructure. And, um, and, and the model that we're currently using is this not exposure based, non directive supporting the patient's uh, inner experience. Um, and we're familiar with uh, the role of music, some understressed the role of music, some maybe overstressing the role of music, but you, music is a very important, I think, component that needs to be acknowledged. Um, and um, and the importance of preparation and integration needs to be acknowledged. And this is our test case or so you see here, one of our, one of our assistants was here on the, and this is Timon Bostun and Kirsten who are just test casing as part of their training. So, oh, I, I put this in, this is my caseload. These are some drawings of patients uh, that, of mine about just to show you what, um, what they struggle with. The Swiss have been uh, continuing with the psychedelic research, and this is Peter Gosser and Matthias Lichty when we were in, in, in Switzerland, and, and Rick, you were there as well, and they have ongoing research, and they, they're just like a machine of, of publication, and Peter Gesser is looking at cluster headache with, with LSD recently, and um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of things are happening there. Oh, a question that I just want to briefly highlight. Do you need to take MDMA yourself? And do you need to take uh, psilocybin yourself? Do you have to have taken ketamine yourself? It is a question that is really important in, in young residents. They all need their own therapy, 50 sessions or so in various countries. And when I was in Sweden to talk to, to the young residents of Sweden, they said, can I have an MDMA session? Can I have a psilocybin session? And, and their, their trainers were a little bit confused, like how are we going to do that? Are we going to allow them to do that underground or are we facilitating that? This is myself where I had my own uh, session. And I think I wouldn't have done this without having had my own session myself. I think it's really important for the adherence and understanding uh, what the psychedelic experience is all about. 
Now, okay, where I'm now, I'm in this for, for four or five years after I spoke with Rick uh, some time ago, and, and this is a castle, but it could very well be a center of excellence. It could very well be a training center. It's actually a castle that's close to Leiden. This was a psychedelic, uh, uh, sorry, this was a psychiatric hospital for the last 150 years. And we're I, I'm just using this that I think we need to have centers of excellence, like you have at Imperial, like you have in Leiden, and you probably will have in Prague, and other other centers where all this knowledge needs to be condensed and training and supervision needs to be conducted from there. Um, and this is Rachel Yehuda you see here, who's a dear friend of mine who was there and is doing the first uh, MDMA assisted therapy in, in the Bronx VA and Ido Simeon who's conducting uh, uh, sessions in, um, in Tel Aviv in Israel. So um, the questions, how am I doing with time, uh, Claudia? I think I have a few minutes or so because I'm near to the end. Now I see that we have probably two streams and, and we have one is the clinical medical use of psychedelics. And I see that there's another uh, domain that's looking at the use of psychedelics for transformative purposes. These are non-patients, these are healthy participants. And we see sort of, I wouldn't say a divide, but in terms of, of organizing or centers, we see that there's a, a, a center where there's healthy people that wanted to have their psychedelic experience and people that want to be treated from a pathological perspective that have depressive disorders or other disorders. I'm focusing on the medical use. I think what we need to do is we have been covered within philanthropy and, and private donors. We need to apply for grants. I think the, the EU needs to, to form a consortium or so that we have to think in terms of Horizon 2020 or maybe um, um, Marie Curie grants that, that there we can, and then maybe these centers that are now moving into phase two, phase three can join together to, to apply for a European, European grant. So we need to build clinical centers at the same time. Um, I think what you, what you um, rightly said also, uh, Cloudy, is we need to anticipate towards reimbursement. We are looking at a four-week inpatient program where we embed the four-week inpatient program with two MDMA psychotherapy centers. Now, the board of directors has approved of our model, and the insurance providers are reimbursing these costs. So I think this is very important that it's not driving up the cost in, in incrementally, but that this is, um, is, and then we have to look at cost effectiveness as well, but um, we need to collaborate with insurance providers. We are scaling to a model. If we are looking towards uh, registration in 24 or so, we, are, we need more uh, certified therapists because once we have the registration, we, we need to have the therapists on board. So we need to have in the Netherlands, probably 30 trained therapists to deliver this as a treatment. So we can't sit still. We have to work on, on getting them in, getting certified centers and trainers to be able to, uh, to treat these, uh, these, uh, these um, uh, patients that, that then um, are waiting for their treatment. At the same time, this needs to go hand in hand with research. And the caveat is we can't lump all psychedelics together. It's not like, oh, what we do with psilocybin, we do with MDMA. These are really different compounds. And also the, psych psych uh, the psychotherapeutic approach is, is different. You can't say that, that the, psychedelic, uh, psych um, the psychotherapic approach for MDMA assisted psychotherapy is similar to psy psilocybin. I think that there are subtle differences that need to be acknowledged. And, um, and this is our challenge, I think. We need to um, emphasize the assisted use of psychotherapy. And now we, we use mindfulness or ACT or, or, or others. So I think we need to capitalize on the specific um, uh, psychotherapy that, um, that, that we need to capture on. Now I said, Claudia, that I was going to um, go over these questions, but um, briefly, one minute or so. Yeah, legal sorry, we're running uh, over time already a little bit. So. Okay. Okay, I think I covered all this sort of um, in, in, in what I have been saying. Um, uh, let me see. And then, yeah, what, the one last one is that this was a conference that was not held because of COVID. Uh, it was supposed to run April 24, 26. It is online in the next couple of weeks. I can, I can highly recommend this. A lot of great presenters have been willing to, uh, to donate, their, donate their time for this program 24 to 27th of, uh, of September. And this is my email address if you wanted to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, that was also really fascinating and insightful uh, what you presented. 
yeah, let's move fast uh, to beer uh, so that we still maybe have a few minutes for discussion. I hope, I mean, I was hoping for more discussion time, but I, all of you are, have a lot of interesting input already to give, so I also don't want to cut that short. So Bia Labachi is a queer Brazilian anthropologist who is now working and living in the US. She has, she has a PhD in social anthropology and her work focuses on the study of plant medicines, drug policy, shamanism, ritual and religion. She's executive director of the Chakruna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicines, which is an organization that provides public education about psychedelic plant medicines. And she's also working a little bit with maps and is doing a lot of fascinating uh, events and online events now and conferences on the more social, cultural and political aspects of the current psychedelic movements we're seeing. So Beer, I'm looking very much forward to your input. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Thanks for hearing me. It's a great honor to be here. It's uh, 6.30 a.m. And this is my tribute uh, to being in this wonderful panel, as I very much support uh, your research, Claudia. And it's an honor to be here with my boss, Rick and Rose. I would take psilocybin with you anywhere, anytime with that lovely accent and that very good spiel. And I just uh, became part of the advisory board of Synthesis, so it's an honor. And Eric also related to Yoast and this conference I posted on the chat. It's a fantastic conference. The Open Foundation is perhaps the strongest, more organized, older group in Europe that has been spearheading this movement. Really excellent people, really high standard quality conference. I highly recommend uh, everybody to go to this conference. Uh, so I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm sitting in Ohlone territory here in California, San Francisco, and uh, I'm going to focus on two things. So Claudia had a series of questions. I picked the two one that I, I feel I have more to say, which is uh, about inclusion and diversity and women and people of color and mar marginalized groups. That's one. And the other one is uh, to talk about how can we incorporate indigenous people into this movement? So I'll go on the two, uh, I'll try to cover these two things. Uh, the question Claudia posed for me is, how can we make psychedelic science and therapy more inclusive to people of color, women, and other mar marginalized societal groups? That's kind of the million dollar question that everybody's asking these days. Uh, so giving a brief diagnosis, we know that there's not a lot of people of color in leadership in psychedelic research. We also know that there are very few people of color that are included as research participants. And uh, I have some information about the US, not Europe. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't do that research yet, but I, I invite people in the audience to take this on. Uh, for clinicians, only 3% of psychiatrists in the U.S. are African-Americans, and only 2% psycho uh, are psychologists, African-Americans. So it's incredibly disproportional. There is a history of uh, people of color not being acknowledged in the mainstream narratives of psychedelic science and healing. Why is this so? Why is this panorama? How can we understand this? So there's a few potential answers. One, there is a history of the medical research establishment subjecting minorities to harm. There's lots of experiments forced without consent. So there is a tendency by these marginalized groups to be suspicious of the medical establishment. Two, people of color might have fear of being administrated drugs related to the uh, criminal injustice that exists in the criminal justice system. Also, there's incredible disproportionate rates of Latin people and African-American people incarcerated, incarcerated to, due to drug-related problems. So it's not the same risk for people of color to take drugs than for white people. And three, there's a real uh, stigma related to the use of drugs. The fact is that people of color can, uh, that 
white people can talk more openly about their psychedelic use, but that's not the same as for people of color. So it's a bit ironic uh, considering that, you know, so many traditional groups use psychedelic substances, but today there's a kind of general feeling, although this is starting to change, that psychedelic assisted therapy is a kind of white treatment. And this is, uh, you know, I just wanna remark a few interesting uh, questions. When we talk about the need to include people of color in research, this is not just because we are progressive, because we are, we're women, we're queer, we're Latin, we're immigrants, and we are progressive and we wanna push uh, the envelope, but this is also just a scientific uh, matter. It's not, it's not a scientific attitude to exclude certain populations. So it's not just a matter of social justice, it's a, a, merit, a matter of, of taking science seriously. In 1993, the NIH issued a mandate that funded research by this institution must include minorities. Uh, the lack of diversity in psychedelic field is not only a problem of uh, representation, of social justice. As I say, it's a problem of scientific research. Because if you do a certain research that you focus only on one kind of ethnicity, then it's harder to uh, expand the findings for other kinds of populations. And so uh, you need to have diversity represented in research. And then uh, there is another kind of ironic sort of cycle that I'm calling here a perverse circularity between conceptual, conceptual conceptualization of research and lack of treatment. So it's important to address the relevance of ethnic and race-based trauma symptoms in related to mental health issues. There's a difference in manifestation and clinical presentation of psychological sy symptoms in people of color. What we're trying to say here is you, the whole science is so much designed by white people for white people that sometimes even the conceptualization of what is disease doesn't take into consideration that specificity that some marginalized groups might have. So it's kind of harder to offer treatment if you don't recognize the, the challenges, the mental health challenges in the first place. And that's a kind of catch 22. So it's important to challenge that the currently diagnosed criteria for PTSD in the DSM-5 do not, does not include race-based trauma. Uh, so I'm not a real expert on all of this. I'm, I'm a researcher in, you know, beginning to understand. We just published a special edition journal in the Journal of Psychedelic Studies uh, called Equity, Access, and Diversity in Psychedelic Medicine. And a lot of what I'm writing here is based on uh, this collection of articles that I very much recommend to all of, uh, of you. Uh, in some, there seems to be a, a perverse circularity where minorities often do not qualify for treatment studies because their symptoms presentation differ from the current diagnostic conceptualizations. So what are some of the path, the ways forward uh, for this kind of challenge? Call out for decolonization for theoretical frameworks the need to provide cultural informed treatment for people of color, need to provide diversity training for team members, need to promote clinical assessment for racial trauma. Psychedelic science has neglected to consider the role of race, race and ethnicity in the expression and assessment of psychopathology, such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Authors advocate for the importance of including race-based trauma when recruiting participants of color for MDMA psychedelic assisted therapy. And then we need to promote uh, treatments that are culturally informed. And this, this is as basic as like care for the setting, um, care for the music you, cho you choose to, to, to put on the sessions care for the recruitment materials, care to explain to people, to these minorities, 
you know, what is that paperwork they're signing? What is the consent forms? How do you announce, is your recruitment materials full of standard language and you want to save money and you don't want to hire an extra expert to reveal the materials because you already got that kit ready. But maybe those materials with some kind of adjustments will talk much more to certain kinds of populations and also just invest in time in sitting and explaining through people the protocols, taking the time and the care to make people feel more comfortable and more safe uh, uh, in, in, in joining this kind of research. So the recruitment methods uh, and also this, the study itself has to uh, show how psychedelic experiences may reflect experiences of racialization. So this is all talking about how can we try to improve uh, uh, recruitment of people of color and uh, researchers, but there's also another all, all other uh, uh, area of care that we should think about. So when we organize conferences, when we create nonprofits, when we create for-profit corporations, do you have teams that are diverse I vo avoid tokenization. What is that? Put a person of color there to show that you care, but that's kind of just for show. Does that person have power in that institution? Does that person sit in the advisory board with a real role? Does that person sit in the board of directors with a real role? When we're, we're publishing articles, try to include... Uh, invite people of color when we're organizing conferences what is your audience are you assessing your audience and their needs are you putting topics of diversity on your uh, on your conference are you putting those same challenges and narratives so at the chikruna institute we're trying to rewrite the narratives of mainstream psychedelic science to include people of color to celebrate people of color to honor people of color and that starts everybody my friends by making friends that are people of color. So do you have any black friend? Do you go to any uh, diversity? Do you hang out in neighborhoods that are different than yours? So I'm kind of really more enthusiastic about activism these days than about <laughs> scientific research. But anyway, I'll try to go back to my, to my science hat. I want to move to the second uh, question. How can... Europe broadened its horizons beyond the scientific medical framework to include indigenous and other plant medicine practices, including their respective spiritual worldviews. How might these voices and worlds enrich and or challenge science vision quest? What can Europe give back to those cultures who have carried the wisdom of psychedelic plants and fungi? So the basic lesson of an anthropologist, and I'm so proud to be one, is like, look to your own history, look in your backyard. You don't have to go fetishize uh, cultures from another part of the world and find a, a remote romantized uh, horizons where everything is so profound and deep. I am from Brazil. I can assure you that we have a lot of challenges. Don't romanticize people from South America or other cultures, but go and start looking in your own backyard. How about we delve into the witches' potions and the solanaceas in the medieval history and what they did with belladonas and mandrak? How much of that do we incorporate into our psychedelic science thinking? And so, uh, you know, I think if we are interested in the substances, we really need to acknowledge that traditional populations have brought this knowledge to us. And now I like to make a, I always like to poke Rick a little bit to keep my, my friendship with him alive, that even if people that like uh, uh, synthetic drugs like MDMA and LSD say, well, I got nothing to do with indigenous people. My drugs come from the science of the lab and that has nothing to do with indigenous people. I say wrong. Psychedelic science has looked on what indigenous people have done and how they use substances. And then have, they have done this, not just by studying the molecules, the properties, the chemistry of it and reinventing it in labs, but also by just studying their behavior. So we must remember that some of the original researchers that were involved in, in even creating the name psychedelics were sitting in teepees with Native Americans. It was when Humphrey Osmond and Abraham Hoffer with the, uh, sat with the Native American group in Canada that they noticed that the Native American was affecting and treating alcoholism. And then they 
they had the idea to try LSD as a treatment for alcoholics. So the very origin of the term psychedelics has a legacy from these experiences with Native Americans. And the way the word psychedelics was envisioned in the beginning, it did contemplate a lot of the spiritual ceremonial uh, uh, relationships that Native Americans praise. So we really need to, to re-examine our concepts of disease and healing and look not just for the next step, what the next technology, the next trend, but what about looking to our history, our ancestors, our ancestors, you know, the people that came before us that opened all the paths that, you know, we occupy their territories and see what they have to teach us. And what do they have to teach us about notions of healing and how healing, as Ross said, is not just about the, the individual, how healing has to do with the collective, how healing has to do with the larger environment. And why can't we create in our million dollar challenges and, and fundraisings and explorations of the new psychedelic businesses, a portion to give back to indigenous people, to honor the ones that open these paths before us. That's what I want to say to my dear friend, Rick Dobling. And I want to always, you know, invite people to look to indigenous notions of disease and, 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 and study more complex classifications where it's not like a little molecule to cure one little thing. It's a more holistic affair, people. It's not just one substance to treat this one problem. We can't be so reductionistic. We really have to try to take into account this other, this other spirit, uh, dimensions of life. And so uh, I, I want to say again, to finalize, and I'm going to the end of my Thank time. You. We yeah. want to bring indigenous people to our conferences. We should look what is there for indigenous people in this. How does that, this matter to them? And this is not just about our white guilt and our wish to have native representation, but how can we support them? How can we help them? How can we reach out to them? How can we honor them? How can we celebrate them? How can we make things that are significant uh, for indigenous people in their terms? And if we want to really be coherent and not just tokenize, then we have to support directly indigenous people and grassroots organizations that support indigenous people or are led by indigenous people. I also want to conclude by quoting somebody called Claudia. And she has wrote this paper in our site. I really love, I love a brilliant woman with a sharp mind. And so she was talking about the title of her paper is Why Psychedelic Researchers Should Not Push Back Against Decriminalization. And then she threw a funky San Pedro cactus in there. And I said, Claudia, what is the relationship <laughs> of this cactus with your paper? And so she's saying, why do psychedelic researchers should not be afraid of drug policy and decriminalization? And then she created this subtitle to the, to the photo, it is. San Pedro in Ecuador. This thorny cactus reminds us that pushing back against something may in the end hurt the pusher. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bia. That was amazing. Thank you for contributing all these important perspectives from these places and people that are often forgotten sidelined in the psychedelic renaissance and that you and others are trying in an activist spirit to bring back um, to us and I think this is really important and I'm so glad we had you here. Um, we have reached actually our time limit, limit but I, I, I was, uh, yeah, we have a few more minutes uh, maybe just to get a brief response uh, from each of you to, to each other, what you kind of took away from from these sessions or how, yeah, what, what's, what's coming through uh, on your ends now. And please keep it short. Maybe just everyone can like say a few sentences, ideally. Who would like to start? I, 
I have just one brief thing I'd like to say, actually, Claudia. Um, thank you, everyone. I really, really enjoyed everybody's presentation so much. It was very inspiring to hear, actually. And yeah, it made me feel quite enthusiastic about the future. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to respond to is a question that, um, that both Rick and Eric also um, raised about the training of therapists and whether it should include that people's own psychedelic administration, psychedelic session. And I really strongly believe that we must um, we must include this. Otherwise, I think that um, I can't understand how. I mean, all of our participants have always asked us um, as guides, like whether, whether we've experienced it ourselves. And I think to say just before a somebody's session that you hadn't experienced it would be, yeah, kind of it loses some of the integrity, I think. And also, as Eric pointed out, just in terms of understanding it, in terms of adherence and it's really, really important that we're not afraid of it. So I think we, we must move towards a model where all therapists um, have their own psychedelic experience. Thank you, Ross. Let's move on uh, to, um, to another speaker. Just uh, really, just very short. We just have one more minute, so. Yeah, just congratulations, Claudia. This is great. We're in a very important time frame with Corona and everybody's homebound. That's another contextual factor. So I, I think that this this is also incentivizing to especially this domain of psychedelics. So I think that that all of us agree that we have a, a, a really an important time frame ahead of us where we need to work together to get this to get this mainstreamized or matured further. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Rick. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, <clears throat> respond a moment to Bia <laughs> and say that um, by trying to make <clears throat> um, laboratory psychedelics into medicines, we are changing the whole cultural context about them and, and that will help indigenous people who use it. And so while we uh, do have large sums of money that we need to raise, the fact that we've not included millions of dollars for indigenous people in our capstone, we're, we're going to be starting to try to raise $30 million for Europe and around the world starting in October or so. And so we just aren't able to um, uh, do everything at once. It's only a few seconds left. So I think we all need to say goodbye at this point. Uh, I'm so sorry. It's so short. Thank you. Thank you all for your Goodbye. amazing work. And yeah, I hope we can convene uh, at another time and have a little bit more time for discussion then. So that would be really amazing.